Well, it seems that Ruby Frankie has finally gone and gotten herself arrested. Now, those of us who have been aware of the problematic Eight Passengers YouTube channel are both pleased and unsurprised that Ruby Frankie is finally being held accountable. The woman was a ticking time bomb, in my opinion. I'm just relieved that the kids were rescued before something more permanent happened to them. And it's only because the kids are safe that I'm even talking about this right now. Um, because I'm actually breaking two rules that I have for this channel. Number one, I do not cover ongoing cases. And number two, I don't talk about anything involving kids. But I'm breaking those today because this situation is so bizarre and I think really important. And it sort of brings up a wider discussion about the ethics behind these family vlogging channels. Also, I just have a lot of opinions and I can't keep my mouth shut. And it's my channel and I can do whatever I want. By the way, if this is your first time here, hi, I'm Rachel Spring. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're returning, welcome back. Now we've got a whole lot to cover and we need to get started, but really quick, um, as we move forward, I need everybody to keep in mind that this is an ongoing case. Everything I'm about to talk about here are allegations. They are alleged. Nothing, or it's my opinion, nothing has been proven in a court of law yet. In this country, we have a presumption of innocence um, until proven guilty and not, not by the media, not on YouTube, in court. That has not happened yet. I'm just reporting about the facts of this case and giving some of my opinions and speculations. Draw your own conclusions. And if you want to support the channel, consider subscribing and giving this video a like. Let me kick this off by just saying that if family vlog channels have one hater, it's me. If they have no haters, I'm dead. And the Eight Passengers channel is one of the reasons for that hatred. A lot of you are already going to be familiar with Ruby Frankie and Eight Passengers and this whole legal situation. Um, but for those of you who might not be, which I put out a questionnaire on my community page, and it did look like some people had had no idea who these people were. So I'm just going to summarize. So Ruby Frankie headed up this family vlog channel, Eight Passengers, along with her husband, Kevin, although it's pretty clear that Ruby was the ringleader of this endeavor. It was pretty typical of the genre, just family doing normal everyday stuff. But of course, Ruby and Kevin's six children featured heavily in this content. Now they did stop posting a couple of years ago, and at some point, possibly earlier this year, the channel was completely shut down. Now it's not clear whether um, Ruby or Kevin themselves shut the channel down, or if YouTube shut the channel down, we just don't know. But until that time, they had amassed a stunning 2.3 million subscribers. A major theme on the channel was the couple showcasing their sort of parenting philosophy, which to many people was at best age inappropriate and at worst abusive. Now, just a couple weeks ago, Ruby was arrested along with her friend and business partner, Jody Hildebrand, when Ruby's 12-year-old son came to one of Jody's neighbors and asked for food and water. The boy was visibly emaciated. His um, arms and legs had been bound with duct tape, and he was in some way had visible like wounds on him. The 911 call that that neighbor made um, has the audio for that has been released. Um, I'm going to describe a couple moments to you. I am not going to play the audio. It's a little bit hard to listen to, um, and it's not for everybody. I will leave, leave a link to where you can hear that audio if you would like to listen to the full call, um, but I'm not going to play it here. The things that stand out to me are a very heartbreaking moment when you hear this uh, man, he sounds like a, an older gentleman, and you hear the moment that he realizes the extent uh, to which this child has been um, possibly detained and, and damaged. His voice audibly 
breaks and you can hear that he is choking back tears. Um, nothing, nothing will get me right in the gut, like hearing a grown man cry. It is, um, it is the hardest moment to listen to, in my opinion, but it does really give you the idea of how bad a shape this 12 year old must have been in. This guy's literally having a hard time keeping it together just to talk to dispatch. Um, there is another moment uh, towards the beginning of the call where he mentions there have been problems at that house before, and she is referring to Jody Hildebrand because this boy was able to tell him that he had come from Jody's house. And towards the end of the call, he says, she's a bad lady. If you listen closely in the background, you can hear this little 12-year-old boy telling this neighbor that it was his fault, the reason he was bound with duct tape and didn't have any food or any water was his fault. It just, it absolutely rips, rips your heart out. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of problems the neighbor was referring to when he was talking to the dispatcher. Um, we have some ideas of what it could be, and we'll get into that in a minute. But the cops did come to collect um, this boy. And then, of course, they went to Jody Hildebrand's house to find the other children that were in there. They found Ruby Frankie's 10-year-old daughter, her youngest child, in a similar condition to the 12-year-old. There was also a 14-year-old in the house. Then the, there's two older uh, Frankie children. They're both adults. There's another older child uh, who's not yet an adult. We, we haven't heard any word on them, um, but it has been reported that there were four children total removed from Jody's home. Jody was arrested immediately. Ruby was located and arrested. She was not at Jody's house with her children. And all four children have been put into DCS custody. As of right now, both women are being held without bail. They actually were supposed to have a bail hearing, I believe, earlier on the day that I'm filming this, or maybe the day before, um, but it was canceled because the defense says that they've just got so much to go through. Um, remember, Ruby Frankie was a YouTuber for years, and they may have to comb through all of her sort of archived footage for evidence. Um, we don't really know. But either way, they're being held without bail right at this moment. However, Ruby did have to go to court for like a sort of a custody hearing. They're trying to determine where the kids need to go. Of course, Kevin Frankie wants the children to be placed with him. And we'll talk about that more um, in just a second. At this hearing, where they're trying to decide where to place the children, Ruby made some allegations against one of her children, we assume the 12-year-old who escaped. The nature of these allegations are such that he would not be able to be placed in a home where there are other children. In my opinion, this allegation is likely a complete fabrication. Again, I'm going to get into that. And that's it. That's an extremely brief overview of this case so far, just for anybody who knows nothing about it. But how did we get to this point? Could somebody have seen some signs and stopped it? Um, where the hell has Kevin Frankie been? And who is Jody Hildebrandt? Let's dig in a little bit deeper. Ruby and Kevin Frankie started the Eight Passengers channel in 2015. At the time, this genre was very popular, and Ruby cashed in on that popularity. Uh, like I said, over the course of their channel, they got like 2.3 million subscribers, hundreds of thousands of views, and presumably were making money hand over fist. It was not that long, though, before viewers started to lay a little criticism on these parents. They felt like the couple, Ruby in particular, was sort of exploiting her children for views, really getting in there on some personal and private moments. The kids were always having that camera shoved right in their faces, and it was pretty clear that Ruby and Kevin were not going to take no for an answer um, when it came to filming their children. 
And you're gonna pass on the sucker? I've had enough brownie for a lifetime. <laughs> I really don't need one. <laughs> Once you hit 99 pounds, you don't need any suckers anymore. You're too old, you're too big. I just had a lot of brownie. I hope you like this one because I accidentally ripped the tag off. I like this. And Why do you keep looking at my chest? Because I am your mother and I just need to make sure everything you wear is appropriate. Worse still is um, this, in my opinion, pure joy that Ruby seemed to get from causing her children distress. When she hands down a particularly draconian punishment, you can't help but see a little glimmer of glee in her eyes. Whether it's sending her teenage son on a weeks-long survivalist camp in the middle of the desert, or it's allowing her five-year-old daughter to go hungry because she forgot to pack a lunch to take to school, the five-year-old forgot to pack a lunch, Ruby just seems to get a sort of thrill from exerting discomfort and control. Two days ago was preschool. Eve slept in. She's notorious for sleeping in. And she woke up and I thought, you know what? I'm not going to wake her up because every time I wake her up, she gets super grumpy and upset. And I have to literally drag her and get her dressed. And she's old enough to do that herself. And she missed preschool. She slept in and she woke up. She's like, I'm ready to go to preschool. I said, you know what? Preschool's over. You slept through it. I'm sorry. And she's like, what? And I said, you need to get up and get ready if you're going to go to preschool because I'm not going to. Did you ruin your bag? What kind of stain is it? All right, Julie. The camera's rolling, so I can't get that mad. <laughs> it helps keep me under control. <laughs> if she sneaks it every night, she can never sneak And you thought you had to sneak it past me? <laughs> oh, honey, that's okay. Are you going to cry? <laughs> She's laughing. Oh. I'm gonna get mad at you for that. Oh, you can bring sprinkles. Chat today has just entered the Anasazi Foundation Wilderness Therapy Program, mm -hmm. where he's going to spend the next eight to ten weeks living in the um, Anasazi Desert. Yeah, the desert mountains of Arizona, and he'll be with counselors and other youth that are trying to figure some things out. And it's reached a point where um, Chad needs to develop some very basic maturity and skills that he's going to need as an adult. And uh, This is a, a chance for like a reset, like a start over, like a do over, like a fresh beginning. Yeah. So the idea is with wilderness therapy is if you can survive with these peers in the wilderness with nothing more than the clothes on your back and a couple of field supplies, then there's nothing in this world that you can't tackle. We, they do not sleep in tents. They sleep on the bare ground. Yeah, and whatever if, shelter they can Or make. if they can make a shelter, they can sleep in the shelter they make. I'm getting out of this conversation. Oh, oh no, this is an uncomfortable conversation. We must have. Lynette, are you angry at me? <sighs> Let's sit. I gave Julie a tongue lashing that will not ever be repeated nor recorded. Just use your imagination. It was bad. I, I am going to say one nice thing, and that is you took your lashing very well. And I'm going to pretend that life is exactly how I want it. And my kids are literally starving. I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like I'm like, a mean barbarian, but I told the kids, I said, I'm not even gonna let you eat breakfast <laughs> until you get your chores done. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. <laughs> and they gave my room back like two weeks ago. Abby, we took the phone away from Abby um, November. in November. Oh, and I just and know why. you may you may never get the phone back. Probably not. I just got a text message uh, from Eve's teacher, and she said that Eve did not pack a lunch today, and can I bring a lunch over to the school? This happens quite often when you're having raising children, um, because I know that her teacher is uncomfortable with her being hungry and not having a lunch, and it would ease her discomfort if I came to the school with lunch. Um, but I, I responded and just said, 
Eve is responsible for making her lunches in the morning and she actually told me she did pack a lunch. So the natural outcome is she's just going to need to be hungry and hopefully, hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch. Kevin Frankie does not seem to share in Ruby's delight, um, although he definitely allowed this behavior to continue and was in fact an active participant in a lot of this um, discipline. And of course, in the just overall exploitation of his children's private moments for views, like the time that Ruby sat down with her daughter to talk about shaving her legs for the first time, or when they sat around the family dinner table and grilled their teenage son, their eldest son, um, about a girl that he liked at school. No texting. Let me see it. Mm -mm. Let me see it. I see it. We should clarify that in our house, all our kids know that uh, cell phones are free game for parents, so we can monitor safety. Yeah, no kid ever said, yay, I'm so glad my parents read my text messages. <laughs> what? Said no kid. What is this? <laughs> I really like you. <gasps> I, hold on. I did not say that. <laughs> How do you work this stupid phone? How do you <laughs> Who are you texting? No one. Any girlfriend? No. Whoa, whoa. I really like you. I saw you in my dreams last night. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's not her, it was her brother. Look, go down. She said, I'm so sorry, that was my brother. Did How she? Do I, go. I saw you in my dreams. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, sorry, that was my brother. <laughs> what is the nature of your relationship with this individual. I mean, there's like 300 texts in here. Um. <laughs> do you like her like her or do you just like her? She's a new friend. That is really, really messy. Um, I don't know. Okay. I see him with her and he likes her. Does she like you back? Probably. Now I want you to keep in mind before you think that people are overreacting, all of this is going on the internet. How would you feel if you were in high school or junior high and you knew that anybody at school could open their phones at any time and see every single moment of your life? Your mom talking to you about your period, your dad addressing your lack of personal hygiene, you with screwed up hair first thing in the morning in your pajamas, filming you stuffing your face with a hamburger, every moment of your life, potential fodder for content on God's internet. Walking into school every day would probably feel a lot like that stress dream that we all have where you like show up to work or school with no pants on, um, except it's real and it's every day of your life. You cannot convince me that that lifestyle does not create emotional damage. The oldest two, Sherry and Chad respectively, are now 20 and 18 years old. Um, you'll also notice they're the only names I'm going to use. Uh, obviously, the Frankies put their kids all over the internet. Their names are out there. I just don't want to contribute to that, so I'll talk about Sherry and Chad because they're adults. But the other kids, I'll, I'll mostly just referred to by their ages. But Sherry and Chad, at least, um, at their age, they do remember a time in their family before there was YouTube. But the younger kids, making content is all that they've known. They've had a camera tracking their every move from the time they were knee high. Wh what, a, what a nightmare. Worse than the humiliation alone were some of the Frankie's parenting tactics, which seemed often excessive for the offense. And in my opinion, and the opinion of many mental health professionals, were abusive. Withholding food seemed to be a favorite tactic in this family. Ruby can frequently be heard threatening to take away her children's privilege to eat if they didn't do things like complete chores or um, stop very age-appropriate behavior, like 
fighting with their siblings. Along with this, uh, there were sometimes threats that caused really clear emotional distress, like the time that Ruby threatened to cut the head off of her five-year-old's favorite toy um, over some, again, very age-appropriate infraction. If you cut one more thing in my house, <laughs> I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, and I'm going to cut its head off. Grandma will be so mad! So what are you going to do? Are you going to cut anything else? No. You promise? Look at mama. They also saw fit to take away electronics from their kids for like except months, months at a time, which like if you don't want to let your kids have electronics, that's fine. But it's really more the way that Ruby would do this. I'm going to get down on your level. I've noticed that you've been hiding from me and you are feeling a lot of embarrassment and shame. I don't know. You tell me what you're feeling. Mad. Mad. Because I really won't get anything for summer. I won't be able to go anywhere. No. I don't have any friends. No iPads, no TV, no. Okay, so I hear you. That sounds like a lot to be taken away. That sounds like it's going to be a miserable summer. And who's responsible for you being disobedient around iPads? Me. You. So it's up to you. If you want to be miserable because you don't get TV or iPad, that is totally up to you. You get to choose boredom and you get to choose to be miserable. What I am seeing, though, is that you're upset with the outcome for being mischievous. And instead of being humble and accepting that there is an outcome for you behaving like that with the iPads, instead you're, you're being selfish. You know, I'm... I'm a layman. I'm not a psychologist. I say this all the time. But it seems to me like a little bit um, sadistic on her part. Like she enjoyed watching her children be upset and in distress. There was one time when she took Christmas away from her two youngest. Now, I don't care what they did. They were like, I don't know, six and eight or something. There's nothing that warrants that. That is hugely distressing for a child. It's not just that these methods of discipline and child rearing are ill-advised, ineffective, and at times cruel. It's mostly that you get, when you watch this stuff, you get the distinct impression that the punishments are much less about you know, molding these kids into responsible, upright citizens, and more about eliciting extreme emotional reactions and distress so that it can be captured for content. Honestly, my opinion, I have a feeling that Ruby would have been disappointed if she didn't have anything to punish her children for, and I would not be surprised to find out that she would manufacture or manipulate situations in order for them to get in trouble, so that they would transgress in some way, and that way she could show off her, you know, parenting skills and, uh, and capture it on camera. If she had perfect children, right? If the discipline that she was meeting out worked, if that worked, and she then had perfect children in a totally normal family environment, she would miss out on millions of dollars of ad revenue and sponsorships. Honestly, my biggest fear ever since I started vlogging was, but what if I wake up and my children are just staring at a wall all day and there's nothing to film. That is legitimately my biggest fear. We, we are going to a movie, so go get on your shoes. What is it? What? Does it even matter? If someone asked me if I wanted to go to a movie, I wouldn't ask, what is it? Run and get your shoes or you're gonna not go. Hurry. Mm -hmm. Everyone run. Hey, this is Ruby. I was wondering, is 
Brooke available to babysit. Sorry. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. What a good idea for spring break. Mom, I'm really sorry. Well, good. I will call her again. Tell her I will call her again. Sure. Okay, have fun. Uh-huh. Bye. Okay. Um, I am not taking Eve, babe, Eve, unless you come and give me a huge apology. You come give me a hug and you come say you're sorry. I did. No, again, where I can pay attention. It was not very thankful of you. I was excited and I told you to go get on your shoes and your jacket to see a movie. And you should say, okay, and be grateful. Instead of, well, what movie? Well, I don't know, let me think about it. That's not very grateful and I'm not gonna take a girl who's not grateful. Can you show some more gratitude? Okay, give me a big hug. I'm gonna go get dressed for football. Um, you're gonna have to go find your shorts. Oh, did you see the socks you threw at the side of the garden? And you are not going anywhere unless you pick up your junk. You've got crap thrown all around. No, so you see now I'm using bad language. That's how bad of a mood I'm in. You get your socks picked up and don't you leave your stuff out anymore. Where? Oh. Right over there. Run and go pick them up. And then give me 10 push-ups. Okay. Put them in your pocket so you can take them down to the hamper and drop and give me 10. One. Put your hands straight out. They're in. They're not supposed to be out. Shape your hands forward. There you go. One, two. two. Down further. Bring your butt down. Ooh. And people are focusing so hard on Ruby. I'm not letting Kevin off the hook here either. Because every one of these things that happened up until the last year and a half when he's not been living in the home happened under his watch. Now, now that he has spent this time away, they've apparently been separated for the last 14 months and he's been estranged from his wife, estranged apparently from his children. And now that he has allowed Ruby to take this so far that she has actually risked the lives of their two youngest children, now he wants to step in. Now he wants custody of these kids. Now he can't believe that this happened and he has no idea how this went down and the kids were never poorly treated under his care. Well, guess what, Kevin? I hate to break this to you, but from where I am sitting, you are an active participant in this whole thing. You sent your son away. You allowed him to sleep for months on a beanbag in the living room. You agreed to these withholding food punishments. You are completely complicit in all of those things and apparently never saw anything wrong with it. You are also complicit in Jody Hildebrand's involvement with you and your family. And we're gonna talk more about Jody in a minute so you can hear what a alleged piece of work she actually is. But Kevin allowed all of that, allowed all of that into his home. If he did think it was all wrong and he still allowed all of that to happen, what, what kind of man is he? Sherry Frankie, um, again, she's the eldest child who is 20 years old now. She came out with a statement after her mother was arrested and said that they have been trying to get the police and CPS involved in this situation for years. Kevin was living in the home still on at least one occasion when CPS did show up to check on things. And CPS at that time found no wrongdoing, but you have to understand that the the threshold for CPS to start taking kids out of people's home, it, it's so low. I mean, if your kid has a place to sleep and there is food in the house and the kids are not like visibly filthy or harmed in some way, they've they've basically done their job. They're an extremely overstressed agency. They just do not have the time, budget, all of that stuff to um, effectively investigate every single thing. Um, they also usually, I don't know how it is in Utah, but frequently if CPS um, is coming for like a, a you know wellness check or whatever, 
they often will not make a surprise visit the first time. They'll like call you and kind of let you know like, hey, we're going to be dropping by. So it's very possible that the Frankies were prepared for this and, you know, made sure to make things as nice as possible, maybe even warn the children about what was going to happen so that they could put on the best face possible. Um, but again, on these initial visits, they see a family who lives in a you know, very nice upper middle class neighborhood, a bedroom for every kid. There's clearly um, money involved in this situation. Um, and you can see a situation where Ruby would say, oh, it's just people on YouTube. They're calling because they don't like the way that I parent, etc., etc." It is very difficult for CPS to catch invisible things like emotional trauma that's being done to children. Um, it's even difficult sometimes for them to catch neglect, particularly in older kids. You know, when you're talking about kids that are 14, 15, 16 years old, it's hard to get CPS even involved at all because those kids are old enough to drive, hold jobs, leave the room if they're not happy with the things that are going on. So particularly when you're talking about these older kids and these sort of, at this time, when Kevin was still in the house, sort of invisible injuries, um, it, it just they're doing the best they can. I don't want to sit here and rag on C on CPS because I do think that for the most part, um, they do the best job they can with what they're given. My point is that, um, you know, Kevin was living in the home still. He was with the children when people were concerned enough to start calling CPS. And at some point, the older children themselves were trying to call CPS and get the cops involved in the situation. From what I can tell, Kevin seems to be complicit at least in part of this. You know, CPS doesn't really care if you yell at your kids, belittle your kids, uh, emotionally terrorize them. Um, I mean, well, I shouldn't say they don't care. I'm sure that there are good people, they do care. It's just that those types of abuse are so much harder to catch and then to prove that they rose to the level of criminal offense because we do have a really strong culture in this country of, of individualism in parenting. Um, that's not true all over the world. In some places in the world, you know, much more of a, a parenting in a communal way is common. But here, the right of the individual parent to raise their children in the way that they see fit is considered paramount. So you really have to prove that these things rise to the level of criminality before a government agency can step in. So I think that that's a lot of what we're seeing here. A slow progression of escalating abuse, in my opinion, um, until it did rise eventually to the level of obvious criminality. I'm getting off on a tangent here. Let's bring it back on track. So Sherry Frankie um, said that at one point she called the house uh, to get a welfare check on the kids. Apparently this is um, after she had moved out and also possibly after Kevin had moved out of the family home. She called for a welfare check because she believed that the kids had been left home alone for five days. Now that may sound very shocking to a lot of us, um, but in Utah, as with actually, believe it or not, most of the country, leaving your kids home alone for five days is not necessarily a crime. It could be a crime, but it's not automatically a crime. Because in Utah, and again, in most states, the age at which you can leave your kids home alone and like for how long uh, is mostly determined on your discretion as the parent. Now, if something bad happens to the kid or it rises to the level of neglect where you've left them home alone and also they're very young and also there's no food and also they're not an age that they can take care of themselves, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's, that's where the crime is, not actually the leaving, leaving them alone in the first place. But at this time, the oldest kid in the house would have been somewhere around 15 years old, and the youngest would have been somewhere around nine. Um, so the, the cops did come out and uh, 
to check on things. They looked through the window. They did see some kids in there, but the kids like ran up. They saw them run upstairs. Nobody would come to answer the door. And the cops just really couldn't do anything uh, beyond that. They couldn't prove how long the kids had been home alone. Um, and they couldn't prove that anything wrong was happening. Now, if there's a 15-year-old and like a 13-year-old in the house, we live 13, 14, 15-year-olds alone with kids all the time. We call them babysitters. Although we can all probably agree that leaving four children home alone, all in the care of like one 15-year-old, most of us would consider that to be highly irresponsible. But it's not illegal and it very possibly is not, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's emotional neglect. But if there's food in the house and mom left money and the 15 year old is capable of taking care of the younger kids, um, there's probably nothing that CPS or the cops are going to do about that situation. It, it's kind of a fine line. Ruby probably and knew that that was a fine line and she was a walk in it. Now, bringing this back to Kevin, because that's what we were talking about was Kevin Frankie. It is kind of hard for me to believe that Sherry went straight to calling the cops for a welfare check without talking to her dad first. It's possible she didn't. It's possible she didn't reach out to him because she didn't think that he would help or she was afraid he was going to be mad or something. But it seems to me like if he's living out of the home and he maybe doesn't know what's going on in the home and Sherry has concerns about the kids, who are you going to contact first? You're going to contact their father, right? Like, they're his responsibility. This is just conjecture. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But it seems to me that the most likely scenario would be that Sherry would have contacted her dad before she went to the cops. And the only reason she would have gone to the cops then is because... A, she was completely unable to get a hold of her father for whatever reason, or B, Kevin was unwilling to step in and come and see what the heck was up with his younger kids, um, either because he agreed with Ruby that what she was doing was okay, or because he was afraid of going up against her and, and, not doing what she said. Uh, also possibly because he was afraid of not following Jody Hildebrandt's rules. And again, I promise you, we're going to talk about Jody. She's got her whole own section, but we do. There is some reason that we could conjecture that Kevin could have had some fear of Jody's influence as well. Kevin Frankie has now spoken out through his lawyer um, and has been very unequivocal about the fact that he wants his children returned to his care. He points out that he has never been accused of physically abusing his children, nor has anybody ever found him to have physically abused his children. And I just think that it's very interesting here, the lawyer's specification of physical. He's never been accused of physical violence against his children. And he has to put that little rider on there, right? Because Kevin Frankie has absolutely been accused of emotionally abusing his children. He may not beat them, but he has been accused of neglect. Now that doesn't mean that he did those things, but he has been accused of it. And, you know, if if they look through all the footage and talk to family members and stuff, and any of those accusations are found to hold water, I question whether Kevin Frankie is a more fit parent than Ruby is. I do absolutely hope that with this newest situation and the level that this has gone to, I do sincerely hope that Kevin Frankie has seen the light, has changed his mind um, and has realized that the behavior that he was participating in and abetting Ruby in, um, as far as their children goes, is very wrong. That he recognizes that Jody Hildebrand is a complete charlatan, in my opinion, and that he is truly repentant for his actions and is ready to make amends. Because I can tell you right now that if I were in Kevin's shoes, um, I would be 
on my knees begging for my children's forgiveness. We're going to speculate some more on why it is that Kevin didn't interfere and how he ended up estranged from his family um, in the first place when we talk about Jody Hildebrand, because her involvement with the Frankie family is maybe the craziest part of this whole story. And it is big beginning to look like Jody may have been the mastermind behind some of the Frankie's most severe and most criticized parenting techniques. This seems to be a pattern for her, according to some witnesses that have come forward. And furthermore, it looks like she's been working with people in positions of power in the Mormon church for a long time. And they have been sending their parishioners to her for therapy for years. She's been paid, allegedly, in church money. And it is possible that these people have been protecting her as well. So you will remember that the Frankie children, who have now been removed from Ruby's care, um, actually were not found in the Frankie home, right? They were found in the home of this woman, Jody Hildebrand. Jody is a licensed therapist, uh, or she was a licensed therapist. I hope that the state of Utah reconsiders that with these charges. She owns a company called Connections. She spelled it wrong. How clever of her. Connections is pretty much the company that Jody operates her like therapy business under. She also has like books and DVDs that she sells, usually with marriage advice, parenting techniques, uh, etc. Her practice uh, focuses on something called getting rid of distortion and living in the principles of truth. If you look at the website, uh, the whole thing is full of these sort of cult-like, completely meaningless platitudes. It's also clear from her list of accomplishments that she works primarily with and maybe exclusively with Mormons, which um, Jody is a Mormon and so are the Frankies. Now, I mentioned over the last few years that the Eight Passengers channel started having fewer and fewer uploads, and then the uploads stopped altogether. Um, eventually, I believe earlier this year, the channel was taken down entirely. Well, while Ruby was pulling away from her family channel, she was upping her involvement in connections, eventually becoming a business partner with Jody Hildebrandt. If you looked on the website, uh, Ruby was listed as a certified mental fitness coach, uh, which means nothing. That's literally not a thing. They made it up. The two had a sort of sit down visual podcast uh, situation that they called Moms of Truth. YouTube saw fit to take down that channel upon the women's arrest, thank goodness. Um, but the videos seem to all be made in Jody's house, the very same house that the Frankie children were being kept captive. Now, seeing the kinds of language that Jody uses as part of her therapeutic approach uh, with her connections program, like having distortions, living the principles of truth, living in shame. Uh, if you go back on the Eight Passengers channel, you can see this kind of language had been slipping into Ruby's vernacular for quite some time. Hey, you guys, I, I need to go have a talk with Russell. The fact that he's not willing to sit with me and be humble and talk is a, a big is a big uh, demonstration to me that he has some distorted views and that he is in a lot of shame. Oh, there you are. I was just talking about you. Do you want to come sit with me and talk? We need you. We love you. We know what power exists inside you. And we want you to be here. So please humble yourself. Become curious about what we're saying. If you start getting reactionary, stop yourself and say, stop. Jennifer, stop. Rachel, stop. What are they trying to say to me? What am I not hearing? Why am I want to fight them? That's your distortion. That's what comes up in me. Anytime I want to fight someone, I'm like, stop, Jody, stop. Why am I getting so reactionary here? Like, there's no threat here. There's no threat. What's going on? The threat that I say is not here, the real threat is inside me. I love principles more than my child yikes that's a really and and that is the 
truth. truth. <laughs> Let us invite you to join me every Saturday to learn about principles of truth. The base being honest, responsible, and humble, and how you can use your choices to empower you to recognize distortion and recognize truth and reframe those distortions, those lies, back into what the reality is, back into the truth, so that your life can become calm. Your life will become clear and you will be able to have connection and peace. It seems that um, based on some allegations people have made and witness statements and um, also just the fact that he was on this connection channel, that Ruby and Kevin had actually been going to Jody for like marriage counseling for some number of years. And in fact, the whole family was seeing Jody. She was acting as like, it seems, based on context, that she was acting as not only like their family therapist, which is fine, there is a thing such as family therapy, but she was also like acting as the children's individual therapist, Chad, uh, the oldest boy. There's a video of him talking about how he talked to his therapist, blah, 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 and we assume that he's referring to Jody. It seems like all the times that the Frankies were doing these disciplinary behaviors towards their children that people were telling them were abusive. And um, they often would rebuttal that they've been talking to professionals, they've been working with the therapist, and this is what they recommend. They may have been talking about Jody, and she's not the best person to be getting parenting advice from, in my opinion, and in the opinions of many other people. But, you know, not only were the couple allegedly getting their parenting ideas from Jody, she may have been the catalyst that drove the couple apart in the first place. One reason that we have to believe this is the story of a man named Adam, who actually sued Jody because she uh, revealed some personal information to his church bishop that she had learned from him in their therapeutic sessions. Now, this is a big no-no, right? There is patient client confidentiality with mental health professionals, and they take that very seriously, or they should. Jody apparently didn't, and she got sued. Because of this, Jody actually lost her license. It was suspended for like 18 months, but she got it back. Now, Adam gave a like five hour long interview on the Mormon Stories podcast, where he outlined basically his whole history. It's a lot. I mean, I, I listened to the whole thing and Whew, the amount of trauma that this man went through even before meeting Jody, the the things that he talks about, it's it's crazy. I'm gonna leave a link to that show uh, in the description. But he had started going to see Jody on the recommend of his bishop and his church uh, because he and his wife were having some marital issues. There is so much wrong with the therapeutic environment that Adam describes um, as far as the kind of therapy that Jody was running that I could get quagmired in how unethical it was. I could probably do like a whole, a whole video just about that, but we'll just suffice to say that what he describes and also what I've heard described by other people who had worked with Jody and also how Jody describes her practice in her own words, um, it is unlike any therapeutic environment that I have ever heard of. And there have been many mental health professionals at this point who have spoken out about this and talked about how unethical it is. Adam goes on to talk about how Jody convinced both himself and his wife that he was was addicted to the consumption of adult materials. And at one point further down the road, when she had begun to isolate uh, him from his wife, had even accused him of inappropriate contact with his own baby daughter. He explained to the podcast that Jody told them that in order to save their marriage, they were going to have to destroy the marriage. And part of that was that he was not allowed to have any kind of contact with his wife. And I don't just mean physical contact. I mean, even if they were in like habitate, cohabitating in the same environment, he was not allowed to talk to her. In the meantime, Jody hired his wife 
to do some work for her and continued to act as her therapist at this time. Now, this kind of dual relationship is very much not okay. But of all the unethical things that Jody did in her practice, uh, this is probably one of the least unethical and most innocuous ones. So, allegedly. Allegedly. Again, if Adam's story is accurate, uh, we don't have any reason to think that it's not. Still, have to say, it's just an allegation. If his story is accurate, this could be exactly the way that Jody inserted herself into the Frankie's marriage and may be the reason why Kevin was living away from his home and had no contact with his family. We also have reason to believe that Ruby was leaving the children in the care of Jody Hildebrand and that Jody is likely the one who was doing the binding with duct tape and the starvation. Now we're not letting Ruby off the hook because it certainly seems as though she knew about this and was condoning it. She may have been a more passive participant is what I'm trying to say. Now, the opinion of the court based on the charges that have been given to these women is that these children were tortured and they may not be the first children that Jody has subjected to this kind of treatment. On another episode of the Mormon Stories podcast, again, I'm going to link that in the description, the child of Jody Hildebrandt's brother, a young person named Jesse, describes their experience with their aunt Jody when she convinced Jesse's parents to turn over custody of Jesse to her. Jesse was a young teen at the time and describes how they had been going through kind of a rough patch with their parents. They attribute this to um, sort of the discovery that they are queer and that being an unacceptable thing for them to talk about with their parents. And of course, they were raised in the Mormon church, believing that this, uh, these feelings they were having were wrong and, and sinful. They had internalized that message, so they were going through a lot of strife as well. But we all know how this happens with teenagers. Um, they were acting out a bit, and... <laughs> extremely mild by my experience, just very, very mild, normal teenage acting out. But this was unacceptable for Jesse's parents. It was a real problem. And Jody said, give Jesse over to me. I'll have them straightened out in no time. According to Jesse, Jody's main technique was to just feed into all of that fear and shame that Jesse was already struggling with. They claim that during the time they lived with Jody, Jody would keep food from them uh, until they were basically starving, would duct tape them, sounds very familiar, keep them isolated from their parents, and even isolate them from their cousins who were living in the same house. Jody would make Jesse sleep on the floor and would sometimes employ really vigorous physical activity for transgressions that Jesse says were mostly made up by Jody. Jesse said that Jody would give them a piece of paper and make them write down and confess all of their sins. If they're were no sins to be had, Jesse would have to fabricate some until Jody was satisfied. Then, of course, Jesse would be punished for these things that they hadn't even done. Again, just a little mid paragraph reminder that these are all allegations and none of this has been proven. And just a heads up to all the viewers uh, I have heard Jesse misgendered a lot. And it's okay. We all mess up sometimes. Uh, but Jesse is non-binary and they use they, them pronouns. So if you do, you know, make a comment or anything, if you could please try to use the correct pronouns. It was incredibly brave for Jesse to come forward this with this information. And I think it's absolutely the least that we could do to not misgender them. The experience that Jesse describes sounds a lot like what could have been going on with the Frankie children. Did Jody convince Ruby to leave these kids with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to rid them of whatever sins a 12 and a 10 year old can commit? I, I think it's possible. Now, Jesse did eventually escape 
from their aunt, much in the same way that Jody's 12-year-old son escaped. They ran away. Jesse was already a teenager and literally chose to live homeless under a fake name because they were so scared of being returned to Jody's care. They felt that if they remained there, they might not survive. And at this time, I want to just take a little step back because of something that Jesse alleged about Jody's punishments. Uh, the thing about them having to write their sins down and that Jody would not like be satisfied with it to the point that Jesse felt that they had to just make things up to say that they did that were sinful um, until Jody finally looked at the list and was like, okay, that's fine. You've done enough. Remember I told you that when Ruby went to court to decide the placement of the children, she made some allegations about one of the kids, probably the 12 year old, that meant he could not be placed with other kids. We all know what I'm talking about, right? I told you that I personally thought that this claim was untrue. This is basically why this story that Jesse told about writing down the sins. It's possible Jody was doing this with these kids. This is just speculation, but you know, what if Jody or Ruby under Jody's direction was standing over this kid, telling him he needed to write his sins. And when he was saying, I, I don't have any sins to write down, he was forced to start making things up and maybe they put things in his head. Maybe Jody said something to Ruby like, um, you know, it's really common for kids to have inappropriate behavior with their younger siblings. And he's so distorted. That might be what's going on. He's really living in shame and we have to find out what he's ashamed about or, you know, who knows? It's so bizarre, but I can absolutely see a situation where this idea that he had done something inappropriate, and maybe he did do something like a little bit inappropriate, like walked into the bathroom while his sister was in the bathtub or something really normal like that. And you know, they blew it out of proportion. And then he was forced to sit here under duress, starving, bound with tape, uh, you know, whatever, having to write out all of these sins that he supposedly committed. And they're not letting him get up until they are satisfied that he has confessed to everyone. So you can easily see. It's like when the police get a false confession, right? It happens all the time because if you put somebody under enough pressure and under enough duress, they will admit to anything if they think it can get them out of the very uncomfortable situation that they're in. So if they promise this kid, hey, it, I'm going to give you food. I'm going to let you go outside. I'm going to give you a drink. I'm going to let you out of this room. I'm going to untie your hands. You just have to write down everything until I say that, you know, you're, you, you're purged of all of these sins, right? You could see easily how this young boy could end up confessing to inappropriate contact with 20 other kids and his siblings. So yeah, that, that kind of uh, interrogation method that is supposedly employed by Jody is exactly the kind of thing that would extract a false confession. And because Ruby is so bought into this Jody Hildebrand cult, she may believe that it's true. Like she may not be like lying per se, but she may actually believe that the things that he confessed to under duress are true, allegedly. Again, this is just, I'm just speculating about something that might have happened. Now there are other options, it is possible that her allegations against her son are true. Um, again, I just don't think it's very likely, but it's possible that that's true. The other possibility is that Ruby knows that it's not true and she's just flat out lying uh, because she's somehow trying to save herself by making it seem like it was okay for her to subject her children to this kind of torture because that's the kind of behavior that they were exhibiting. If that's the case, then Ruby is in for a real shock because guess what? If your minor child is having inappropriate contact with other children and you know about it, guess who's responsible for that legally? 
you are. It's you. If your 12-year-old is exhibiting that kind of behavior and you have done nothing about it, um, you are legally culpable for that. And also, by the way, it doesn't really matter what kind of behavior your children are engaged in. It does not give you carte blanche to abuse them. I think that given the history, uh, the alleged history, that as this investigation goes on, we will likely find out that this horrible, horrible allegation that Jody made against her 12-year-old son is completely without merit and likely something that was fabricated by Jody in the same way she did with Adam, allegedly. I'm sorry that I keep having to insert allegedly, and in my opinion, it's not a reflex. I'm doing it on purpose because we are talking about an ongoing case where nothing has been proven yet, and I need to legally protect my myself. Um, so I'm sorry if it's distracting, but I just want to make sure unequivocally that I am not going to be uh, held for slander, okay? Because I'm just reporting on things that have been said by people. Now, there is a lot to be said here about the involvement of the Mormon Church, who has worked very closely with Jody Hildebrand and has been referring people uh, for more than a decade to her very unethical, apparently, care. But I am not the right person to tell that story. First of all, I'm not, I'm not Mormon. And second of all, uh, to be ethical in this situation, I think that it is important to be upfront and recognize your own bias. And I have such a strong bias against organized religion as a whole. And it is a, a bias that I likely could not set aside in order to discuss this subject in an objective way. So I'm just not going to get into it at all. I will, however, refer you once again to the Mormon Stories podcast. Um, they have those couple of interviews with the people that I've talked about, and they've got some interviews with um, some mental health professionals who speak specifically about the ethics of what we can tell so far about Jody Hildebrand's practice. Um, and, you know, there's talk about the ethics of the Mormon church's involvement, etc. So Mormon Stories podcast, linked in the description. If you would like to dive deeper into this subject, please go see that. But I will say that the involvement here is, again, if all of the allegations are true, all of this holds water, is looking like it's bordering on conspiratorial. Now the question remains, could this situation have been prevented sooner? And also, whose responsibility is it to do that exactly? Ruby and Kevin Frankie are not by far the first family vloggers who have faced criticism. And as the children of these families are starting to get older, get out of that environment, grow up and get away from the influence and are feeling more free to speak out. Uh, many of them have. You can go to YouTube, TikTok, a lot of them are on TikTok, and, and you can find these um, adult children of family vloggers who speak out about the emotional damage that was done to them by having their whole lives put on the internet. It is becoming more and more clear that more often than not, these channels are exploitative at best and abusive at worst. If you want to have a channel that focuses on parenting, I think that that is awesome. And you can absolutely do that without ever putting your children on camera or, or just putting them on camera a little bit. I'm not putting my kid on the internet. You are never going to see my child on this channel unless this channel goes for lots more years and he gets old enough that I determine he can make that decision on his own. Um, you will never see my kid. That is for his privacy. He's adorable. I'd love to share him with all of you, okay? But I'm not going to because he is not old enough to consent to having a bunch of strangers being able to look at him forever. But everyone has their own level of comfort with, with how much they're willing to expose their child to the public. And that's okay. We can all have differing opinions on that. But make no mistake, if you have a social media 
presence. Um, you have a YouTube channel, you have an Instagram, whatever, and you were to remove your children from the equation, okay? If you remove your children and you then do not have any content, then that channel is not yours. It's theirs. And they are working children. And there is a very good chance that you are knowingly or unknowingly exploiting them. And I do think that if you do not stay conscientious and really put yourself in the shoes of children and understand the way that children think and feel about their parents, um, I do think that it's possible to unknowingly exploit them. Come with me now on a little journey. Just humor me while I lay out for you a hypothetical situation. Let's say you run a family vlog channel. It all started seven years ago when you just uploaded a fun little video to YouTube just, just for the heck of it. It's you and your two kids. We'll call them Gurla and Boilo. And you guys are making cookies for grandma at Christmas time. The kids are adorable. Gurla is four and Boilo's like almost two. The video of these adorable tykes gets a few likes, a couple thousand views, and some positive attention in the comments section. You decide it is harmless fun. You're going to keep uploading some cute little videos of your kids. After all, they are so precious and adorable to you. How could you keep that from the world? Before you know it, you're uploading videos a few days a week. You're gaining subscribers and getting lots of positive attention about your cute, adorable kids and what a good mommy or daddy you are. Eventually, you get popular enough, YouTube monetizes you. Now, you're actually making money from all those views. And the more people watch, the more money you make. One day, you're making a video of Gurla practicing riding a bike, and she's clowning for the camera. She falls, she scrapes her knee. It's not too bad, it's not like hospital worthy or anything, but it does bleed. So the still frame of Gurla with her bloody knee and tears streaming down her face becomes the thumbnail of the video with the title, Gurla got injured, exclamation point. This video, goes viral. The sympathy pours in from strangers everywhere. Condolences for little Gurla and heaps of praise for how well you handled that traumatic situation. You make more money from this video than you have from all your other videos combined. Your subscribership quadruples and brands start to reach out. Ye oldie bike company sends you an email and says, we'd like to send Gurla a brand new bike. Of course, in exchange for a feature on your next video. Now, Gurla is so excited. Uh, she loves this bike. It's beautiful. It's custom made for her. Bright pink. She knows that all of her friends are going to be so jealous. But of course, um, every sponsorship comes with stipulations. And Ye Oldie Bike Company wants to make sure that Gurla rides around the bike with a big smile on her face and talks about how smooth the handling is. She wants to send a big thank you to Ye Oldie Bike Company because she knows that with how good this bike is, she's never going to have to worry about falling and hurting herself again. So now, for the first time ever, instead of just filming your kids doing the cute stuff they normally do during the week or whatever, um, you're actually contriving a situation and telling Gurla what she needs to say. In other words, you are now producing, directing, and scripting your videos. All goes well. Ye Oldie Bike Company is so happy with the video and they become a regular sponsor of your channel. You start just sort of suggesting and directing the kids to play a little more with the bike company toys that they send and to talk positively about them. You start to notice that videos that have a lot of conflict and high emotion do a lot better, like the video of Gurla scraping her knee. And so more and more, you find yourself looking for clickbait situations and encouraging your family to emote more. No injury goes unfilmed. No sad moment is kept private. Titles like, Boilo got bullied by his preschool teacher, question mark, exclamation point, and we almost got swept away in a flood become normal. And now you are not leaving thumbnails to chance. The family is now posing for big facial expressions. And your spouse quits their job 
so that there can be somebody to do all of the editing and uploading um, full time on multiple platforms. You start doing photo shoots just for Instagram. You're also uh, taking time to film extra exclusive content for your channel members or your Patreons. Every single video has at least one sponsor now. They're absolutely clamoring to partner with you. And so you move the kids to a bigger house in a nicer neighborhood. You put a lease on a brand new minivan and you start taking the kids on vacation multiple times a year. Now, a lot of these vacations are actually brand trips. Uh, they're being paid for by the resort or the hotel. So you don't really get to like really relax because the kids have to produce content. You need to show your audience what a great time you're having at Family Vacation Spot Incorporated. But the day comes when Boilo and Gorilla are done. They're tired. They don't want to participate anymore. They had a bad week. They don't feel like smiling and jumping around exuberantly while they unbox the newest sponsored gadget. They're throwing a fit, refusing to participate. And so you have to sit them down and tell them they can't quit. See, the content that they produce is what keeps a roof over their head and food on the table. If they won't participate, everything goes away. The house, the toys, and worst of all, this is mommy and daddy's job now. If you won't make these videos, you won't cooperate. Mommy and daddy are out of work. Now they know the consequences. They know what their responsibilities are, and the kids never complain about it again. They play to the camera. They always do what their parents ask. Children do not like to disappoint their parents. Children are hardwired to know that their parents are the only things that are protecting them from a world in which they cannot function alone. They are hardwired to keep that relationship uh, a good one, happy, stable, one where mommy and daddy love them and are going to take care of them. After a few years of producing content from such a young age, these two kids don't even know that they have another option. Fast forward to present day. Gorla is now 11 years old and she does the best that she can to keep it a secret that she's part of a vlog family. But with 2 million subscribers on YouTube and 500,000 followers on Instagram, the inevitable does happen. Some of her classmates see the video. Gorla's first period? False alarm? Question mark? The other middle schoolers, which we all know is the meanest age of child, start to bully Gorla. They're watching videos from years before when she like wet the bed or ended up in the hospital with a blueberry stuck in her nose. She's getting bullied daily. Sometimes just because kids can be mean. Sometimes because these kids are literally jealous that she gets to be an internet celebrity. When the school calls to discuss this situation, you wonder, did you make the right decision? You just wanted to make some relatable content for the internet and give your family the opportunity for a life that you could have never provided with a nine to five job. When Gorla and Boilo come home from school, you gather them together and ask, are you okay with all of this? Are you okay with being on the internet? Yes, they exclaimed excitedly. Yes, the kids at school don't bother us that much. We love doing YouTube. We wouldn't have it any other way. They don't dare disappoint their parents by being honest. They know that they are the ones that provide for the family. Their parents count on them to bring in the money. They said so. The parent, who's eager to maintain the lifestyle that their children have provided, accepts this answer. Children who are barely entrusted to choose their own dinner are given full autonomy over their decision to work when it benefits the narrative that the YouTube parent wants to be true. That is exactly the kind of slippery slope that can befall the children of family vlog channels. Now this is an almost best case scenario with a loving, albeit misguided parent. But this type of lifestyle is extremely attractive to abusive, narcissistic parents, which I suspect Ruby and Kevin Frankie are. Just my opinion. No doubt that the children in the scenario that I just described are working. And yet there are no child labor laws that cover vlogging. The law is so woefully behind the times in this new digital marketplace. For the most part, kids on the internet are still viewed like it's America's Funniest Home Videos. But these are not just some home videos. These are major productions with major money behind them. A lot of these family channels are working their kids more and also 
bringing in more money than miners are in Hollywood. Their labor is being fully exploited and there's no legal protections for them at all. And while I absolutely do think that laws need to change in order to reflect the actual working conditions of these child influencers, some place that we could start would be the platforms that host them. Now listen, I love YouTube, okay? Not only is it the platform that I've chosen to host my own content, but I'm also an avid YouTube watcher. But in my opinion, they and any other platforms could be doing a lot more to keep these family vlog channels accountable. For instance, it was totally fine for Ruby and Kevin to make all this monetized content uh, using their own minor children to talk about withholding food from them, to exploit every little intimate moment of their lives, to show them injured crying, embarrassed. YouTube is making a lot of progress in this area. I hope other uh, platforms are too. I know TikTok is literally the worst about it, but I do just think that more could be done to monitor these channels and to make hard decisions about what is and is not okay to be hosted on the platform. You could, for instance, stop monetizing channels where children make up more than 50% of the content or require that any content, any content that features minors have the comments turned off, restrict advertising on them, make it literally just less profitable to exploit your kids. Ultimately though, so much of the responsibility falls to us the consumer. We can choose not to engage with these channels, not to allow our children to watch them. We can choose not to do business with companies that partner with channels like this. If we make it so that having that kind of channel is too risky to do business with, people will just stop making that kind of content because it won't be lucrative anymore. And no, Going to those channels, leaving hateful comments, uh, not helpful, okay? Every single time, whether you hit the dislike button or you leave a comment, even if it's a negative one, you are feeding in to that engagement, okay? All attention is good attention when it comes to the world of social media. If you happen to see something that's truly horrendous, you can report it. But other than that, if you can just ignore that content, that's the best way to make it go away. Anytime you create a situation where outlandish behavior can be hugely profitable, you're always going to have people who behave badly, sometimes socially, sometimes criminally, because the draw of money and attention is just too good. It's likely that these people were going to exhibit antisocial behavior in some way anyway. It's not the social media that causes the behavior, right? Like you're not gonna, there's no amount of money or attention that you could give me um, that would cause me to do those things because that's not my personality. But social media and the way that people can profit in that way uh, is going to be very attractive and, and draw in a lot of people who already have those tendencies. And you know what? I say live and let live. I do not have to engage with the content that I do not enjoy. If you want to make your living by making a complete fool of yourself on the internet, or you want to allow strangers to follow you on every little intimate part of your life, and, and that's what you want to do, go for it. But you should not be allowed to make that decision for your minor children. Now, it's probably going to be a while before anything happens in court with Ruby and Jody. I do believe that they have some kind of hearing coming up on October 17th. We're still looking to see if they're going to get bail. We'll just have to uh, keep checking in. But these kinds of things can take a while. They are facing some very serious charges. Six counts of aggravated child abuse each. I really hope in the meantime that all of those kids are able to get some help for the turmoil they've endured. I know that the uh, daughter, Sherry, the oldest, did show up to court, um, the court date that ended up being rescheduled, but she was there with her lawyer. Um, I kind of wonder if she's in college right now, but 
I, I do wonder if she's going to maybe make a push to get custody of her younger siblings. She's 20 years old. Courts have done that before. If she can show that she is um, financially stable and able to take care of those kids, then, um, you know, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that she could end up with custody of them. I don't know if she wants that or if she's asking for that, but I'll be continuing to follow this case as it progresses. My heart goes out to all of the Frankie children. And listen, if you're someone who enjoys watching family vlogs or you let your kids watch them, I would encourage you just to really look at them with a critical eye and really think about is what they are doing ethical or are they exploiting their kids for views? Are they exploiting their labor instead of just allowing them to be kids? And then, you know, make some decisions about your consumption based on your own personal ethics. Thanks so much for being here with me today. I have lots more content planned for the future, so please subscribe if you haven't already and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Be sure to do something to take care of yourself today and every day, and I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye!